Hey, Deserving Listeners, Escaping Twin Flames documentary on Netflix. Let's continue watching. Chrissy's a high-ranking member of the military, and now she's in charge of MAP. My alignment process was specifically going to be used for people who had diagnosed PTSD or trauma. You were going back to the traumatic event. Uh-oh. So, I don't know. We'll watch, but... It sounds like the Twin Flames organization hired or worked in collaboration with this clinician who was tasked with helping the members or the clients with their trauma in which they actually discuss their trauma, which if you know anything about trauma or if you've heard me talk about it, then you know that to recall one's traumatic events can be very harmful to one's psychology or to one's functioning, to one's physical bodies. It can cause a, a lot of problems. You know, there's a lot of research that I can go into. Sleep, concentration, depression can get worse. Anxiety can get worse. Association can get worse. P one's PTSD can get worse, of course. So it's very important that, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a very quick... <laughs> I'll try to be as very quick as possible. I feel like I'm yammering a lot. But uh, when I work with, when someone comes, say someone comes to me and says, I have trauma in my past, and I, and then we do a quick assessment, it turns out they do have a lot of the signs of PTSD. And they say, I want to not have PTSD. I want to recover from the trauma of my childhood. I would uh, tell them a, a longer version of the following, which is that, well, you come to the right place because I'm a specialist in this. And the healing action will occur when you are talking about your previous traumas, you're remembering it, and I am here to help to collaborate with you as you sift through the meanings of it and as you habituate to the memory. And by telling the story through prolonged exposure or some form of exposure uh, enough times, you, you your brain essentially will habituate to the memory such that you will no longer have a traumatic reaction when you remember it or you have that that memory triggered in the future and over time science shows that if we do this enough times with enough traumas then you will no longer have symptoms of ptsd and thus a lot of other things will improve in your life I'm, this isn't my model this is a well-researched model that's been you know in development basically for decades uh, i have my particular way of doing it but in order to get to that place before we can actually recall your traumas and start to do exposure therapy or that healing action I was saying earlier, we have to make sure that you are in connection with your needs and your emotions and your body and also have the ability to regulate that. Because as we head into the recalling of your traumas, it will, if you actually have PTSD, and if you actually are recalling a trauma that's related to your PTSD, you are going to have distress. And if on a scale from one to 10, the distress goes to an eight, then that can actually make your PTSD worse. And at the very least, it will be very uncomfortable for you. And you might not want to ever come back to therapy for that. Or it could ruin a month for you. Like you could become dissociative or confused such that you can't function at work or at home. So obviously we want to avoid that, but some distress is necessary in order to habituate. So on a scale from one to 10, we are hoping you will actually get to a four. If you don't go above a one, or if you only get to a two, then it's not enough intensity such that you will habituate. We actually have to get you up to a four, but we, don't, but we do not want you to be above a five or a six or whatever arbitrary sort of threshold we say. And so I will say, in order for me to be able to trust that you can tell me where you're at in session and out of session regarding your distress level, I need to make sure that you even are in connection with your emotions such that you can, in the moment, not retrospectively, but in the moment, tell me exactly how distressed that you are. And for many people who have been traumatized, unfortunately, they have a hard time connecting with their emotions and might even dissociate in the middle of a session and it won't be apparent to me or the client. So I need to do a lot of prep work before we get to there. Now, it's possible that in a very quick you know, set of sessions, maybe five, 10 sessions, we will establish that not only are you aware of your emotions, but you can actually regulate them. 
not only regulating them here, but regulating them out there. Because when we start to do exposure therapy in between sessions, you are, you're going to have some spikes in all likelihood, and you have to have you know, 50 different ways to regulate your distress down. And uh, the reason why you have to have 50 different ways is because what if one doesn't work or you can't do, you know, you can't, if hiking, for example, is one of the ways that you manage your distress, you can't always go on a hike. So you have to have 50 different things that can work given the context. And so it might take five to 10 sessions, but it could take five to 10 years for us to get there. I don't know where you're at. So so that that's the lay of the land. Okay. So I hope that they take those precautions because that's what the science says. With a MAP practitioner, that's what they called them. So when we do the mind alignment process, it's very powerful because we go to the root of the trauma and we pull it out. Chrissy K did one or two sessions on me. Okay, that's not a good sign. We don't know what happened in those one or two sessions, but for the cult member, they're saying one or two sessions. And if we're about to head into content of recalling trauma, then that is not ethical treatment. To close your eyes, I just want you to walk through the memory again. And what's going to happen is I'm going to freeze it and we're going to we're going to clear it. OK, in this like meditative state, things are kind of suggestible. Now we'll go back to where you can go to the root of it and heal. And as we do that, the layers start coming off. She suggested there was sexual trauma that happened when I was like a kid. All right, well, it's even worse than I thought it was going to be. Not only is it just one or two sessions and the clinician is just rushing the client into the exposure, which can be very harmful to people. Just to give you an idea, I, I, I think I read an email recently from someone that said that their therapist wasn't going slow enough for them regarding trauma and would tell me that she would leave the session and go to her car and just cry in a fetal position for like an hour and then she would manage to get enough motivation or strength or something to drive home and then she would just be in a daze and she would be confused and mildly dissociative and each day would kind of blend into the next because she was just going through the motions you know going to work and kind of confused at times and disconnected, detached from her emotions and from the world. And people would ask her, like, are you okay? And she would like, yeah, I'm fine. And then slowly she would start to realize that she had been affected by the, that session. And then a week would pass. She would go to the next session. She would report that to the therapist. And the therapist would say, well, that means it's working. Okay, now let's go back into the exposure. And the therapist, the client would say, okay. And then it would happen all over again. And when I hear stories like that, it mortifies me. And it's not uncommon to hear that. I myself, when I was first a therapist for many years, uh, you know, the first portion of my career, I was told that I knew enough about trauma to treat it. And I would treat clients like this. I They would tell me, I want to talk about trauma, and I would... I would be quite honored that they felt like they could uh, trust me with that. And I did see some clients who probably didn't have PTSD tell me about a story that they might have never told anyone else before, and they did feel better afterwards. But for those people, they just didn't have PTSD. They had been traumatized. They had conditions related to trauma, but they didn't have PTSD. PTSD is very particular. So this is upsetting to to see. It's, it's kind of typical to see this. And... In the beginning of my career, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then when I learned what I didn't know, maybe 10 years into my career, I was like, oh, <laughs> why didn't anyone tell me this? I don't know why. Trauma is such a commonly understood presenting problem and thing in the world, especially for us in psychology. I don't understand why we don't have more robust instruction and supervision and and a culture that really, it's getting better, I think, but there are still clinicians that are doing this shit and it's, and it's, it's very upsetting. I'm mostly upset for the clients because, you know, they're going to the right person. They, you know, not everyone does that. Uh, they're going to the right specialist. The specialist says that they specialize in trauma often. And what are people supposed to do? We expect people to go to therapy and we tell them, you know, make sure you go to a therapist. Hey, make sure, oh, it sounds like you go to a therapist. They, they look it up, trauma. Okay, they go to that therapist, and then they're just completely mistreated. 
harmed even, made worse even. And research shows this. This isn't just me making this shit up. To my best belief, I don't think I've ever actually had anything like that in my childhood. It was... Oh, so not only is it bad trauma therapy, but she's also inserting traumas. She's actually convincing the individual that she has been traumatized, which is, uh, yeah. Uh. Now, the question you have is, if that's true, that the therapist did insert a memory, why was the therapist doing this? Why was the clinician doing this? Were they doing it because they're, they're nefarious? Or are they doing it because of another reason? And it's, in my estimation, more often another reason, which is that there are some people that are convinced that almost everyone has been sexually abused in the past. I feel like it's not so much this way anymore, but when I was coming up in the field, I would often find myself in meetings in which I'm talking with other therapists. We might be consulting about cases, and a good number of the other therapists would always ask the, well, it would not even ask the question, they would just make a statement. I was like, oh, that, that person sounds like they've been sexually abused. And I think the reason for this is that in the past and in our society, we tend to deny sexual abuse as a, as a thing that happens, right? We sweep it under the rug. We don't talk about it very much. And then you enter the field and either you have been sexually abused in the past or you start coming across clients you have and you start saying, whoa, there's a lot more sexual abuse in the world than society will let us uh, know about. And so you start as a clinician thinking, well, who else has been? And, and you might even be rewarded by a lot of clients who have said, well, yeah, I mean, you're the first person who even looked in that direction. And yeah, I was sexually abused growing up. And as a clinician, you start to f almost see everyone as someone who was sexually abused in the past. So it's a confirmation bias sort of thing. And so for some of those folks, they can take it so far as to actually just assume like, well, clearly this client has been sexually abused. So I just have to route their uh, memory in that direction because it's, it has to be there given everything that, that I'm seeing. And then they don't necessarily go into it saying, I'm gonna insert a memory. They're, they're going into it thinking that they're finding a memory, but what they don't know that what they're doing is they're actually socializing the client to believe that they were, that they had an experience that they didn't. It's like a memory that was sort of planted inside of me. The map process started the whole like process of not really wanting to be around my family and feeling like. And of course that's the function of this, whether it's intentional or not, that it separates the cult member from their family members who could be supportive to them, generally speaking, and also is, a, is an opposition to the cult. We had a meeting one day about how to fish for clients for MAP sessions. We were going in PTSD groups, injury groups, fibromyalgia groups. The internet is a place teeming with people with problems. And if you walk up with a solution, oh honey, people are lined up out. Yeah, it looks like he is getting his people to troll the internet for victims. Now, it's one thing if they had a product that was ethical and sound, but uh, because, you know, if, if you have a product, like if, a th if you're a therapist and you're trying to get your practice off the ground and you're advertising yourself as such, then there's nothing wrong with that. You're actually potentially uh, doing a, a public service by announcing that you have spots available because a lot of people might be looking for a therapist with spots available. Uh, you're also uh, promoting your business, of course. But it's another thing if you're promoting something that not only has no evidence of working, but there's a lot of science demonstrating that this model actually is going to harm people. <laughs> so, yikes. Your door. We were coached to tell people that it would heal all of their problems. Let's license this, you know, this training program to the military, and then I'll be a billionaire. Chrissy called it a clinical trial. So it was all very official, like, you know, she was applying for grants within the Army. One of my mentors is in charge of the financial department for the Pentagon. Okay, so at least one of the members, the former members, is claiming that the clinician was promoting this as a clinical trial. And I'm trying to remember the exact legality or ethics around this, but 
uh, and if there are exceptions to this, but generally speaking, when us in the field, and there's very clear guidelines that uh, will guide us and dictate what we should and should not do when it comes to these kinds of things, when we are developing a research program, there has to be outside observers who will sign off on your methodology and will, in, in a sense, oversee your process such that you won't harm people. We can't just do research and gather participants without making sure that an independent review board actually says, okay, that is okay to do. And sometimes, you know, they'll look at the methodology and say, ah, that's actually too much risk to the participants because we have a history in psychology and in, you know, medicine as well. You would have scientists that would move forward with projects that would harm people. And so we decided at some point in a variety of different ways to actually, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so I wonder if for the clinician, if it actually was an official and ethical clinical trial, or if she's just calling it a, a clinical trial. Jeff and Shalia took this idea and made it into a daily meal plan called Divine Dish. I got a personal chef who's making the food that my company, Divine Dish, procures. Divine Dish is a divine gift. There was a $100 monthly fee. Well, it's just interesting how diverse his scam was <laughs> that he's even controlling or getting people to believe that his meal program, because this is another zeitgeisty thing, right? That these home delivery meal service, you can just imagine him hearing about one of them and saying, ooh, you know, maybe I could tap into that. It just, I don't know. It just seems like that could be possible. How about that? That's a sandwich. Most of the meals are carb-based. A lot of like heavy, like red meats. They told me you have to eat all of your food. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Good. And it's another way of controlling your your members, right? It, it, when you look at cults and study them, it's almost like any freedom that the members have is a threat to the leader and to the cult organization. And so they'll want to control everything from what you eat to who you have sex with to what you think, what you do, what your job is, everything, who, who you're friends with, what you, know, what you believe your own past was, how you identify yourself, how you dress. They, they'll want to control everything about you because any freedom you have could be a threat to the control of the cult. A lot of people gained weight really rapidly. Before I met Shalia, I was, you know, I had fine taste in women, so to say. I was concerned maybe I'd lose attraction if she got, you know, ugly or overweight. But as she slowly gained weight throughout her relationship, my attraction level only increased. <laughs> So this is another common aspect of cults, particularly when men are in charge, in that they seemingly will control the members to be attractive sexually to them, whether or not they even engage in sexuality with the members. Like with Bill Gothard of the IBLP, you know, the Duggar deep dives that I did, that me and Alberto did, he seemingly was attracted to a particular type of woman with a particular type of dress with a particular type of hair. And there were allegations or observations of the sort of pressure that he would put on not only the people around him, the women around him, but also just all the women in the cult at large around the world. And it wasn't just like, hey, you know, my, why don't you do your hair like this? That'll make you attractive. It was connected to the spirituality, you know, godly women, women who are serving God, women who will get into heaven, women who will have children that will be happy and accepted by Jesus. They will have hair that, and he he, he had, he seemingly like sort of the, the big 80s hair, <laughs> and you know, God bless, but... Uh, to force all of the members. So who knows, but it's possible that Jeff is pushing, I, I didn't show all the clips, but the cult members, the former cult members were claiming that Jeff was pressuring everyone to eat a lot of food. And when you 
ate a lot of food, then it made it spiritually so that you were more likely to find your twin flame. And so who knows, but maybe it was either subconscious or a conscious attempt at trying to make all the members visually attractive to him. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.